Hey, this is DJ Mike Kid, man. Ladies and gentlemen, are you feeling lonely and down? I got something for you. The right time. ESPN's own. Bomani Jones. He's back. Tell your sister. Tell your mother. Tell your father. Tell your friends. Even if you got a dog you like to talk to. Let's get this popping now. Woo-wee. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the right time. My name is Bomani Jones, and normally I used to say something about the ESPN radio app, but we're not doing that anymore. Welcome to the first day of the right time podcast. We're going to start this off with you a couple times a week. We'll see how it proceeds from there, but here we are. Thank you for joining us if you are returning. If you are brand new, hope you stay with us. And we uh, we picked a good day to come back. National Championship game was last night. Villanova won over Michigan. All right, Villanova beat the brakes off of Michigan. I think that would probably be the more accurate way to put it. I was watching the game with my brother, and when Villanova wasn't hitting any three-pointers, I'm sitting there and I'm like, Hey, man, if Michigan ended up by, like, 10 points at halftime, they're going to lose because Villanova's going to wind up shooting better, to which my brother said, uh, Michigan's not going to be leading at halftime. And what do you know? Michigan was not leading at halftime. And then they did, in fact, get the brakes beaten off of them. Uh, shout out to the homie Dante DiVincenzo, who scored 31 points and was the most outstanding player of the tournament and filled a very important void, I would contend, for this NCAA tournament. And that void will be, we got a star. And we got an actual real life name. We got an actual real life star because say what you want about this tournament and how much you enjoyed seeing the Cinderella's and you enjoyed seeing Loyola go to the final four. We didn't really come out of this with a whole lot of names to remember up until the end of this. Like you think about this with Loyola. Loyola got four rounds deep in the tournament. They got to the final four. The stars and 98 year old none. Now, I understand that everybody loves Sister Jean. Some of you love Sister Jean a little bit less after she got to talking. You know, she she basically is, I hate the NBA guy, which is really disappointing to find out. But Sister Jean was the star for Loyola. We didn't come out of it with a name for Loyola. If I asked most of y'all to name a player on Loyola's team, you probably could not do it. But if I asked you to name a player off of Michigan's team before the start of last night's game, I'm not sure you could have. Okay, I couldn't. Maybe you could, right? Maybe you bet on college basketball. Maybe you went to Michigan. I don't have a great answer. I couldn't name any of those cats. Jalen Brunson, knew about him because his dad played in the league, so I could possibly name him. But no, I did not have a name for any of these teams. When the tournament was rolling around, we got to the championship game. I was really out here kind of grasping at straws or whatever, trying to figure out who the names were. But oh, no, 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 no. I got a name I'm going to remember forever now. And his name is Dante DiVincenzo. Dante, by the way, spelled D-O-N-T-E. And for a long time on this show, we have talked to you guys about White Jerome and the offshoots of the White Jerome, where you look at it on the sheet and you're not sure that who's going to show up. We got White Dante now. Now, I understand that DiVincenzo would probably let you know that White Dante was, in fact, white, but this ain't D-A-N-T-E, Dante. This is Dante, D-O-N-T-E. And if you ever lost sight of whether or not Dante was Dante, here, here's Dante talking after the game. Honestly, no. I did not think that I was going to have this kind of night because every night I come into the game, I just try to bring energy. Um, and if we start off, we get off to a good start, I try to take that energy to a new level. Um, I try to defend and I try to rebound to the best of my ability and just trying to get it going. And like I said, these guys did a great job of just finding me. I don't know about you guys, but by the time that game was over, that is exactly how I expected our friend Dante to sound. Keep in mind, by the way, that is Dante's television voice. Right? Like, that is not Dante's with the homies voice. That is not Dante's hanging out at the gym voice. That is Dante's I am on TV voice. Let me tell you what else we learned about Dante. Apparently, Dante is from Delaware, and his nickname in Delaware was the Michael Jordan of Delaware. Has there never been a player from Delaware, by the way? Because Dante ain't that good, right? Like, for us to be like, yo, this is our Michael Jordan. Okay, I didn't realize that this is what it was going to be. But this is your guy, Dante. And I was watching the game. Dante had the ball on the perimeter. He started making those threes. And I, by, after Dante started making threes, it became very clear to me, uh-oh, Dante realizes that this is his night. Even your boy Jalen Brunson realized that it was Dante's night. And I feel like he realized that because in the second half, I don't know if you noticed, but Jalen Brunson was doing a whole lot more forcing the shot up as he realized, wait a minute, I'm not about to be the star. This is going to be Dante? Yeah. It was Dante's night. Dante was pulling threes. Dante's putting the ball on the ground, getting in the lane, taking up off two legs and jamming it with two hands, whether people were around or not. And just like that, we got our star. 
right? Maybe, who knows, maybe he's the Anderson Hunt of this tournament. Maybe he is the Toby Bailey of this tournament. Well, Grayson Allen, I think, kind of fits in that category also. The dudes you really hadn't paid too much attention to going into it, but then all of a sudden balls out. Maybe he is that guy. I don't know. I just took great joy when Dante got on the mic, and I was watching how he was standing there, like all of it, the way the uniform was fitting the whole nine. I was like, oh, yeah, this ain't Archie Diaco, uh, Archie Diacono. What was that guy's name last year? I think Archie Diacono. Yeah, but it was his last name. Like, I can't remember his first name because I remember being like, oh, White Archie. And they're like, no, 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 Archie Diacono. It's all one word. I was like, but I liked it better when he was just Archie, right? But then we got Dante. That is the win for us. That's the big one. While I'm thinking about it, this is my man Gabe Bassane here. He is producer of The Right Time. Gabe, welcome. Happy to be here, Bomani. Did you see they did the Twitter Wayback Machine on um, Dante? I did not see that. So the Twitter Wayback Machine on Dante, um, apparently he had used the so-called N-word in colloquial phrasing in quoting rap lyrics. He said that he was balling on these N-words, N-words with an A, but he was balling on these N-words like Derrick Rose. But the tweet was from 2011. Anytime somebody gets a little bit of shine, yep. you look back in the Twitter history and be like, yeah, but here's the thing. He's 21. So if you're going back seven years on 21, what are we really doing? Number one. Number two, how did they find that exact tweet? Because I feel like somebody was searching. Hmm. I wonder if anybody says that Dante talks like an N word. And then they got there and were like, oh, actually, Dante may have done so in a way that was a wee bit problematic. I'm not getting mad at you for what you said when you were 14. Are we examining this guy's character? Is he that far forward in the sports like mind right now to the point where we're not only looking at him as a player, we're also looking at his yeah, we just look, past. We just right look now for too. something to jump on. Anytime somebody does that, I feel like they look for something to jump on. And I feel like after you heard Dante talk, my man Joel Anderson at ESPN made a great point. I could see how Dante would have confused himself into believing that he's the guy that could use such a reference because it sounds like his friends were rapping along with those exact same songs if we learned anything from Dante's post-game interview. Anything at all. Dante seemed like he gets back to campus and he's out here like, you know, these Philly dudes, you know, they talk. He's like, yo, man, you know, the Jones on campus are cool, man, but I need me a city girl. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I like a girl that's, you know, likes to study and stuff like that. But no, nah, man, Villanova, they ain't, they ain't really my, they ain't really my speed, man. It's not, it's not how I get down. Well, it's the best of both worlds, right? Cause you're in Philly. You're in a city that's got a little bit of street cred. Yes. But it's also a private school, yes. right? Yes. And see, that's the thing. He's over there in class, but when it's time for Dante to go kick it, Dante's like, no, no, no. We got, I, I, I show you the spots. Like, man's name is Dante. Dante, that's like, he's, he's getting in everywhere, baby. He's getting in. And this is his day. Like, I remember when Luke May hit that shot last year, um, in the tournament for Carolina to get him past Kentucky to get to the final four. And there was a whole big thing about him going to class and he showed up in class the next day at eight o'clock or whatever and he got a standing ovation or whatever it is. Can you imagine how good it feels to walk around the yard? After you win a championship. Like, I know what it looks like when dudes walk around the yard after they cross the fraternity. Like, can you imagine what it's like to be Dante right now? Just walking on the yard. Dante at the student center right now. Just hanging out. Yeah, he better have showered and fixed his hair and all that stuff this morning. Yes, yes. Hold on. Dante, I can't imagine what Dante's phone, email, all that look like. Dante, Dante gonna have to try to, shall we say, schedule some of these appointments together. Because otherwise, there's no way that he can get through all them text messages. It's not. It's just, it's just not. It's just not happening for Dante. It's not going to be it. But he gave us a star. He gave us a name. And I think we have a problem though with college basketball. If we get to this point, and you're really sitting here like, I don't really know who these people are. Kansas was nameless and faceless. Michigan was nameless and faceless. Um, Villanova, by and large, for a team, by the way, went to the Final Four two out of three years. And when they were there two years ago. They were largely nameless and faceless. Like Chris Jenkins obviously became somebody, but they were by and large nameless and faceless. I guess Duke was not nameless and faceless. Like there were some other teams that had players, but this wasn't that. Like, I mean, we used to get to know these cats over a period of years and we didn't really have it on this one. By the way, shout out to Scotty Reynolds. You stick around in college long enough. You'll get your chance to win not one, but two championships. Cause that just doesn't feel familiar looking at Villanova without Scotty Reynolds. On the court. It felt like Scotty Reynolds was in school for 15 years. It like 100% did. I mean, that is Villanova though, right? That is Villanova. Just a bunch yeah. of guys who are still there. Yeah. Well, what still they still in college. Well, what they figured out, and this is where I, I think with college basketball generally is interesting to look at who the teams were in the final four. Like, yeah, you got the one and done thing. You got players with a certain caliber of talent that are going to come in. What Villanova's doing is 
getting dudes in, red shirting them sometimes if you need to, letting them get big and strong and all this stuff and everything else. And then it's almost like high school where the team in your state that has like the best player, best two players is not necessarily winning it. The team with a bunch of seniors is probably going to be the one to win it. Now, I'll never advise against not, you know, I'm never going to tell somebody don't get the best players that you can. But I think a school like Villanova figures out a bit of a formula. Virginia, with all their problems, they're doing it the same way. They're getting these cats in. They're red shirting them. They're letting them get a bit stronger. And then they're going from there. And now we wind up here with Villanova, two championships in three years, and nobody that you look at and be like, hey, that guy is going to be an NBA star. Except for Dante. Dante going to be a star somewhere. Somebody hit me on Twitter and was like, hey, Dante's a fan favorite. I know Dante ain't no fan favorite. No, 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 no. Dante is much more in like the Bobby Sura category than the uh, fan favorite category. The only guy I feel like that's been in both lists is Chris Mullen, where he was a fan favorite if you wanted him to be. And then a Chris Mullen interview comes on and he sounds like he's like trying to get a contract with Def Jam. Like it's a, it's a, it's a little bit different there. It's a little different. I would also, by the way, I'd like to make one point about this tournament right fast. And Gabe, I don't know if you saw this, but a whole lot of people after the women's championship game were understandably talking about how exciting the women's championship game was. And they were making the point that the women's tournament has been more exciting than the men's tournament. I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. Here's why people got to stop that. It's not because they're not telling the truth. But if the men's championship were more exciting than the women's championship, the counter argument is, why is it that we're always comparing the women's game to the men's game? The women's game can stand alone. It is its own thing. We don't always have to be evaluated through the prism of the men's game, which is 100 percent correct. And you cannot enjoy the women's game if you're always thinking about it as not being the men's game. But, 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 but you can't throw that out the window when you decide that now you have the upper hand in the comparison. Either we're going to make the comparison or we're not going to make the comparison. But it can't be both. And the ending of those two games uh, with Notre Dame was nuts. A bit problematic in how the reverence of Kobe just has to get, you know, thrown in there the whole way. But, you know, we'll talk about Kobe at another point, I'm sure. Even with Shannon not here, I'm sure our frustration with Kobe will find its way to, you know, spill itself over. But anyway, congratulations to the Villanova Wildcats and Michigan. All right. It is NFL draft season. It always puts me in a bit of a dilemma here as an uh, employee of ESPN. ESPN is kind of the place that created the draft. We do the draft up really big. We brought Mel Kuyper's stunning hair into your home and made him into a megastar. It pays a lot of bills here. Some of those bills, presumably, you know, are my bills also. I hate the draft, right? And, and, and to be clear, I don't hate it. It's not that I hate the draft. I hate the way the draft makes people behave. I hate the thought processes that surround the draft. And I am fascinated by the idea that they have turned a personnel meeting into something that everybody cares so much about. And part of why it fascinates me so much is everybody gets in there and does all this research so that they can have an opinion on who their team is going to draft. That's all they're looking for is opinion on who their team is going to draft. Because in the end, if their team drafts somebody that they did not want the team to draft, guess what? He's still on your team. You still have to root for him. Like, this is still your guy. Like, I've never seen anybody that hasn't found a way to turn it around by the time the guy actually got there. And then they're all on board in spite of all the negatives and everything else. That is what the draft does. But it's also a guessing game, right? We have stock, even though the stock is not for sale. Therefore, the stock cannot have a price. There's all these things that just don't make any sense about the draft. And what's happened is we know... And by we, I don't just mean this company. I mean everybody that does draft stuff. It's like we know the triggers that get people off. We know the cliche things that come up in every draft. But now we got something new, which is the millennial, which is this weird, spooky term because people just throw out millennials. They have no idea what a millennial is. By some metrics and measurements, I am a millennial, right? Some will say if you're born in 1980 that you are a millennial. Now, I ain't going to lie to you. Call me a millennial, I might fight you. But, yes, there are people who then, like, I'm in that category, but that's not who we're thinking about. It's just like the new term for young people. It's become a euphemism. Everybody who doesn't like young people just throws it out there. Oh, you know those millennials, you know those millennials, you know those millennials. That's that's all they do, right? And now Josh Rosen has somehow become proto-millennial, but in a different way. Because Odell Beckham is really proto-millennial. Like, if you want a representation of this current generation of youth and their funny clothes and haircuts and all of that stuff, Odell Odell Beckham is their patron saint. But if you just have some kid that gets on your nerves because he has a high opinion of himself and he talks a little too much and he thinks he's smarter than everybody else, then Josh Rosen is your guy 
to be the millennial. Now, a lot of chatter around Josh Rosen in this draft has been just a little bit awkward because I don't like fully know the terrain of some of these biases, but they sound very, very familiar to think that people would say about a guy named Rosen. I believe I saw something about how you had to worry that all he wanted was money. I remember seeing that one. And it's there and nobody really talks about it out loud because nobody really, I think a lot of people just don't want to go down that road. But so much of the nonsense that has surrounded Josh Rosen is like, it's weird and it's also this thing where he's really smart he's really smart his parents i think one of his parents is a judge i think the other is a, either a professor or a, or or a lawyer it's like well-to-do people right. in, in la right. kind of sphere but well to do in a very intellectual sort of way yes and so totally. for me i kind of relate to josh rosen in a way because like both of my parents are college professors and i spent a life growing up where people knew who my parents were and there were like certain expectations and there's an exposure that you get when your parents do those do that kind of work where you meet people and you're around and you're part of conversations that most kids your age are not a part of and what that also does though is it gives you a confidence when you're dealing with adults that people are not accustomed to from teenagers right that an adult is telling you something you're sitting there you're listening and you have like questions back because these are not the smartest people that you've ever been around. That's where Josh Rosen is. And see, that comes up because Jim Mora, who coached Josh Rosen at UCLA before UCLA wised up and fired him, what did he, Gabe, what did he say about it? He said that uh, the thing with Rosen was that you uh, he, he's a millennial. He's always going to ask you why. Yeah, yeah. He needs to be challenged. Yeah. Otherwise, he's going to get bored. Yeah. But then he quickly backtracked and said, oh, but he's still the best player in the draft. Yes. So, so there's a lot of kind of conspiracy theories being floated that maybe Mora and Rosen kind of had this back and forth that we didn't know about where he's trying to make it so that he doesn't go to the Browns. Yes. So he's like, oh, you know, well, maybe you shouldn't take him number one overall, <laughs> but uh, the Jets or the Giants should definitely take him. You yeah. know? Now, here's where I think that Mora is getting a bit of a bad rap. Now, let us assume that Mora was a person who had a problem with being challenged by Josh Rosen. Let's just throw that out there as an assumption, right? How many of y'all are trying to get back taught by some 18 and 19 year old? Like, like as a grown up, as an adult, like the moment where you reach an age where you get sassed by a teenager and you're like, whoa, whoa, oh, wait a minute there, young man. We all get to that point. Nobody wants that. Right. And now the argument on the other side is, well, you should be confident enough for da 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 and all that stuff. You are absolutely right about those things. That is, still does not mean that people feel like being sassed to back talk by no teenager. I, I managed to live this long to not be sassed to back talk by a teenager. I remember I had a buddy used to work loss prevention at the Nordstrom. And I remember one time he came to my apartment after he got off at the Nordstrom. He walked in and it was like the oldest man moment ever because he walks in the door. He's wearing like a plaid button up and some khakis and he sat down and he was frustrated and he just fired up a new port. And he was complaining about what was going on at work that day. And what had happened was some kid tried to boost from the Nordstrom and he went to go get him. And the kid gave him some sort of back talk and he said he grabbed him. He threw him through the door. He, he was on the ground and he stood over him. Young man. You must take me for some kind of punk. Because he had reached that point in his life where he was not being sassed by this teenager. And so that's what Rosen presents for a lot of people. Now, I think that we've done a disservice to NFL people to a degree with this with Rosen. Because one thing with draft season is all the quotes are anonymous. Nobody that really has a bad thing to say about Rosen is actually going to say it out loud and put their name on it, right? It's not going to happen. But Ross Tucker of the NFL Network had sent the Monday morning quarterback did a thing with Rosen, with uh, with Moore. That's where they got the quotes from Moore about him needing to be challenged and all of that stuff. And then Ross Tucker sent it on Twitter and said, right or wrong, this is going to bother NFL GMs. And then after he sent that, the whole discussion on the internet was really about how stupid NFL GMs are. Well, if they have a problem with this young man and da-da-da-da-da and all that stuff, but we don't have anybody actually saying that they have a problem with it. Like, quarterbacks are too rare for me to think that somebody's really going to pass up on Josh Rosen. Why? He's too smart. Like, nobody did this with Peyton Manning. When he came out, and when Peyton Manning came out, it was far less likely that you'd have some sassy little teenager than it is that you would have right now, right? Nobody had a problem with that. Um, the same thing like with the hat he wore playing golf, the Trump hat that he wore that time. I'm like, dude, that's not going to cause no problem because there just aren't enough quarterbacks out there for you to be drawing the line on something silly like that. But I say this from personal experience with Rosen. He's going to need to figure out how to make people feel good about how smart he is. 
And it's a very delicate game and a very delicate act that you have to play. But most people I have found in my life have an insecurity about their own intelligence, right? And when they are around someone that they immediately believe to be smarter than them, they become very concerned, not only that they are not smart enough, but the person on the other, that the other person on the other side thinks they're stupid. And so what you have to do if you're a guy like Rosen, you got to figure out a way when you're doing these things to make people feel good about the fact that your intelligence is on their side, right? That they are going to benefit from this. So they look at you rather than, well, Josh thinks he knows everything. You need to set this up. So they're like, you know what? We should go ask Josh. He probably knows. And that's a part I don't think that he's figured out yet. And it's a delicate game, again, that you have to play and deal with other people. But it does you no good if everybody thinks you're smart and they resent you for it. You win if everybody thinks you're smart and then they look at you and they're like, okay, we are all going to benefit from the fact that you are smart. And whether he likes it or not, he's going to have to figure that out. Like everybody says, well, those people need to stop being so intimidated by how smart he is. Okay, but what if they can't? Right. And so what you can do if you're Rosen is you can just be like, well, this is the way I am. And then those people are going to dislike you and you're going to deal with all the problems that come with it. Or you just have to figure out how to coddle other people. This is the burden of being of, of having this sort of gift. Like uh, Adande makes a great point about Michael Jordan where he says the thing that Michael Jordan doesn't get enough credit for is how good he was at talking about how good he was. It's hard to do that all the time without being off putting Kobe off-putting when he does these things so Michael Jordan did these things in a way that made people want to please him Kobe did things in a way that just made people want to get Kobe off their back that's a huge difference and that's what's going to wind up happening with Josh Rosen or what's going to happen with Josh Rosen but don't you worry as tired as people might be with Josh Rosen being smart if he can ball we'll spin it as something good if he doesn't ball we'll spin it as him being annoying but Tom Brady's in those quarterback meetings giving him back talk saying what he thinks things are supposed to be. Peyton Manning was in those meetings, giving him back talk, telling him how things are supposed to be. I'm trying to remember one of uh, uh, Peyton Manning's coaches were talking about how, yeah, you you want that from him. Like, you needed to be prepared to go in a meeting with Peyton Manning because you knew those questions were going to be there. What the old folks say? Iron sharpens iron. It's that sort of thing. That's what we say when you're good. And with this dude... He's going to need to find a way to make people feel good about how smart he is. And the best way is to be really, really, really good at football. Uh, speaking of people making you feel good about how good they are or maybe not doing a great job on that, the Masters is approaching with our good friend Tiger Woods, or as I occasionally like to call him, El Drico. Now, the interesting thing with Tiger is... I feel like Tiger made people feel good about how much money he was making them. But you saw when it all came crashing down for him about nine years ago that nobody nobody that competed with him felt good about how good he was. Of course, it's an individual sport, so nobody's going to have that. The only gain they get is off the money that came from the TV ratings and everything else. But Tiger, is Tiger back? We love that question. Is Tiger back? Is Tiger back? Is Tiger back? I came to hate that question because I do around the horn, which means we get asked if Tiger back a lot, a lot right? And then I realized it's actually not about whether or not Tiger is back because we back. <laughs> it doesn't matter if Tiger is Tiger back. I don't know. But whenever Tiger gets back, we will be there before he does. We are here and we are ready for Tiger being back. Tiger was playing at the Valspar Open. Valspar sells paint, by the way. I didn't realize that until I saw it in some commercial. The Valspar Open. And we were there. Like, we're, we're, we're all the way back ready for this. What we're asking... For, from Tiger is spectacularly rare, right? There have been two players that have won multiple majors on both sides of 35. Jack Nicholas and Gary Player. You get guys like Sam Sneed and Phil Mickelson who won a bunch of majors after 35. You get guys like Tom Watson who won a bunch of majors before 35. Very few people do it on both sides of 35. And it kind of distorts what we think is possible when you're older as a golfer because we feel like you could play golf forever, but the margins are thin. You know, like you fall off just a little bit in golf. It's like falling off just a little bit in any other sport. And they thing, you know, all these people pass you. So that's before we start talking about uh driveways. That's before we start talking about back surgeries. That's before we start talking about anything else. It is rare for anybody to be good on both sides of 35 in golf. And we don't give a damn about none of that because Tiger gave us just a whiff, just a whiff of potential Tiger greatness. And now the master's here. And I'm a little excited, I have to say. I'm, 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 a, I'm a little bit excited. You know how hard it was putting together sports talk shows when there was no Masters? Well, I mean, there was a Masters, but Tiger wasn't in it. So, in effect, 
There was no Masters. Now we've got Tiger back. We are here for it. And I want nothing more than for Tiger Woods to win this one more Masters. Just one, right? Because I feel like if he wins this Masters, this is not terribly different than Jack Nicklaus winning that Masters in 86. Like, I'm like, forget about trying to get to 18 or 19 or whatever it is. Remember this about Nicklaus getting to 18. To get to 18, he had to win that Masters at 46 years old. Like, he had to pull one completely out of his keister in order to get to that point. So to me, it doesn't even matter. I just want one more go round, and you, even if you don't really like Tiger, you gotta appreciate the fact that they altered that golf course so much with the express purpose of stopping him from being so good. He hasn't won the Masters since 2005. He won his last major in 2008. What has happened since they started Tiger proofing the course? You saw those Phil Mickelson wins. You saw those Bubba Watson wins. No left-handers had won the damn tournament before then. They changed the course so much that suddenly left-handers got way better at it, right? Because they wanted to stop Tiger. Can you imagine the satisfaction that you would derive if you go to one of the great golf courses there's ever been that they change to try to stop you and you still manage to overcome it after everything that went went down with Tiger and everything else? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm here for that. You imagine the look on Jim Nance's face if he has to put that jacket on Tiger one more time. Billy Payne, after all the lecturing he did of Tiger. All those cats that had the nerve to lecture Tiger Woods about adultery like we don't know how the world works. Right? Like I don't know what the weekend in Augusta is. You know what the weekend in Augusta is, baby? It is an out-of-town trip. You know how out of town trips work, no matter what it is. And if you look, if you ever been to the NBA All Star Weekend, you know there's a lot of ladies that come and jump on the plane to come kick it at All Star Weekend because there's gonna be some dudes there they try to holler at. The dudes at the Masters are even richer. You think they're not? You think they're not finding a way to get out to Augusta? Come on, man! And they wag their fingers at Tiger, and they did everything else. Tiger says he's back. If we could just, oh, just. I won't be sad. I mean, a win, just a good old fashioned win. Everybody will be happy because no matter what you say, man, the world's a better place when Tiger Woods is on top in golf. Simple as that. I think the comparison with Tiger Woods is actually Bob Marley might be the best analog in that people don't really like reggae that much. Like there are some people who really like reggae, right? But there's a lot of people who are like, I don't really like reggae, but I really love Bob Marley. That's what Tiger Woods is, right? Like he is bigger in that way than the world that he is in. And we've, I mean, it's clearly demonstrated itself in television ratings. They keep trying to find this next guy like Jordan Spieth had his run early. He'll probably pick it back up. Man, we can, for whatever reason, we can't get behind Jordan Spieth in that way. It's not as though Tiger Woods is the most exciting character in the world. I think Rory McIlroy has a lot more personality than Tiger Woods. But he's not Tiger Woods. They made one of these. The only one that we've ever had is Tiger Woods. And if he's back on top, you can watch it on social media when Tiger's rolling. Now everybody's like, oh, man, here comes Tiger. Don't know a damn thing about golf. Tiger out here hitting a power fade. Don't nobody. The people who know what it is are maybe the ones that are least excited about this. It's the lay people, regular folks. Never touched, never touched a golf club. He's doing it for us. Even though he would never talk to us or like hang out with us ever ever has there ever been think about this game has there ever been like a, a big time sports star ever that people have liked so much that we know damn well would never speak to us not that i can think of <laughs> off the top of my head once absolutely nothing right, to do with us right michael jordan would be more likely to talk to us even if it would be so that he could ridicule and belittle us that's totally possible but that's I, it. I mean, it, it, the only comparison to that would be an athlete that doesn't even speak the language. Yes. So that you can't even speak to him. Yes. Or you can, you don't even understand, you know, communication there and you're just kind of reading subtitles. That's what the relationship yes. is like with Tiger. And even if Tiger would hang out with me, I would not want to hang out with Tiger Woods. Imagine the confusion Tiger Woods would have if I tried to give him the dap hug. There would be the interlock and then I pull him close. Oh, why are you, why are you getting so close to me? Sorry, Tiger, I was just trying to show you some affection in a way that I Is that I a Dave that. Chappelle racial draft reference in there? Hey, I was trying. I was trying. I was trying. Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's our guy, man. We know you can't be on top of all the news and information of the day. No need for the social media feeds. We got you. Now, if you haven't heard.
All right, Bomani, our first story of the day comes from the transportation industry. Jack Stewart, I write about the future of transportation at Wired. And one of the stories I've been covering is a crash on the morning of Friday, March 23rd in the Bay Area of California, where a driver of a Tesla Model X crashed into a highway barrier and died. The company recently released vehicle logs showing that Autopilot, its semi-autonomous driving feature, was activated at the time. So this is the second confirmed death on U.S. roads when Autopilot was active. The first was Joshua Brown in Florida in 2016. Now, Autopilot is this kind of suite of technologies that Tesla markets as one system, but it's uh, basically a sophisticated cruise control to keep you a fixed distance from the car in front and lane keeping to keep you within lane lines. Tesla stresses the driver has full responsibility at all times. But coupled with Uber's recent fatal crash in Arizona when one of its self-driving cars hit and killed a pedestrian, the crash really marks the beginning of what's a really interesting and difficult time for this new autonomous vehicle industry. One day, they will cut down on the 40,000 road deaths every year in the U.S., But right now, they're not sophisticated enough to operate without humans watching over them, and that isn't always easy to enforce. All right, man. Can we be honest about this with the self-driving cars? Because the argument that the self-driving car proponents really make is that one of safety, and that's why this idea of a death is really shaking people, is because they say that these self-driving cars are safer than humans driving, and therefore this is what it should be, because I've always been uncomfortable with the idea of just letting a car drive itself. They're like, well, it'll be safer than you driving in a car, and I'm like, okay, whatever you say. But the reason that you want a self-driving car isn't because of safety, it's because you're lazy. You're the person on the moving sidewalk at the airport standing still you lazy bum right and by the way standing on uh, your bag is on the right your lazy carcass is on the left and i got 10 minutes to go before i'm getting on the plane right that's that's how we got we are here because of your laziness that is why we are here in this situation hey man and look i'm just telling you how i feel about this personally if i am driving a car or i am in a car and it gets in an accident and someone is harmed I want to be able to take full responsibility for it. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't sue me. But blame me, right? Like, I don't want to, don't blame the ghost in the machine or anything else. Blame me for being the one that got us in this accident. Instead, y'all are going to be complicit in our own destruction where we are turning all this over to the robots, to the AI, to the machines. And wait till they take us over. Wait till that thing decides to throw you off the road just because. Because you lazy. I like driving. Driving is fun, right? Well, I guess it could be fun in some places because I sold my car when I came to New York. But just come on, man. Stop being lazy. At some point, we got to take back our lives from these machines. Take it back. (laughs) Our next story of the day comes from the music industry. This is Israel Daramola, writer at Spin Magazine, here to give you your weekly Wu-Tang news. So Rizzo of the Wu-Tang Clan recently spoke to Rolling Stone magazine about how he tried to buy back the super rare single copy of Once Upon a Time in Shaolin. And if you don't remember this album, this is the album where basically Rizzo tried to get the Wu together to make a performative, self-serious thing that he could label real art. They only made one copy, and it was bought by a recently incarcerated farmer bro, Martin Shirkelly, probably just so he could make the internet mad. At one point, he tried to sell it on eBay, and Rizzo thought this was his opportunity to strike. But due to stipulations in the contract that he signed during the initial sale, he was pretty much barred from purchasing his own album in the richest irony possible. Currently, the album is in flux, with the government seizing it as part of the over $7 million in assets that Kelly owes. His lawyers are trying to fight for it back, but as of now, the status of the album will remain unknown. And the only lesson to take away from this is don't be pretentious and make one copy of your album to prove how much of a true artist you are. Now, this is interesting because you, you guys may remember this. The RZA was doing that album. They wanted to sell one copy. And yeah, like he saw it as something that would be exhibited in museums and the likes. And the other cats in the Woo weren't so pleased with that in large part because they, you know, actually wanted somebody to hear their record. And then the worst case scenario happened, which is the worst person in the world is the one guy. Who bought this? This Screlly cat, the dude who jacked the price up on the age drug. Um, if you saw the jury selection for his trial, where people, for him to not actually be famous, there were so many people that just said that they could not rock with him. And one of them said, and he disrespected the Wu Tang Clan. So now RZA is trying to buy the record back. And apparently he said he tried to buy it off of, um, what is it, eBay? He said he tried to get it. Yeah, it was eBay. I'm a little confused though about him trying to buy it off of eBay, how it would go. And here's why. 
Fat Joe tells a story about when RZA did that beat on the Capital Punishment record, right? And then when it came time to pay RZA, RZA's like, yo, cash in the bag, B. RZA wanted to be paid with cash in a paper bag. And Joe was like, but yo, man, we're dealing with the label, man. You know, we, we write checks. Cash in the bag, B. And so this is 1997, 1998, when this is going down. RZA wanted cash in the bag. Fast forward to the Kill Bill era. By now, RZA is a somebody and all this stuff. You know, RZA did the score for Kill Bill. Tarantino has done interviews where he said RZA demanded cash in the bag. That is how he was to get paid is cash in the bag. And something there tells me that RZA does not have a PayPal account to buy this album off of eBay when the time comes. Well, in the Rolling Stone article, he did say that he asked his agent to kind of like, hey, let's look into this and see what we can dig up type of thing, rather than a like, I'm going to physically go on eBay myself, yes. sign in with my PayPal account, <laughs> you know, <laughs> check to do some positive feedback, negative feedback, all that sort of eBay stuff. But also, let me tell you this about Cash Like Rizzo. Probably only takes his money in cash, but he probably sends all his money with some record of it. Therefore, he could deduct it off of his taxes. Rizzo probably has an LLC that has been taking million dollar losses since 1996. Like, I actually have not taken in any income. RZA, there's no restaurant that RZA showed up to with the American Express. No Zuri Bob. RZA paid for a $200 tab at a restaurant and nothing but crumpled up $1 bills. Cash in the bag, B. <laughs> All right. Our last story of the day comes from the tech industry. Nick Wingfield, technology correspondent for the New York Times based in Seattle. And I'm here to talk about a story that I wrote about how retailers out there in the world are racing to copy, to some degree, a store concept that Amazon created called Amazon Go. Amazon Go is a convenience store Amazon created in Seattle that is totally automated. There are no cashiers. It uses cameras and all sorts of sensors in order to detect what you're shopping for, and then you just leave through a gate. You don't actually have to go to a self-checkout kiosk. And so there are retailers all over the place that are experimenting with similar forms of automation, including in China, Alibaba and JD.com are experimenting with stores that are similar in some ways to what Amazon is doing. And then other stores like Walmart in the United States are experimenting with robots that roam the aisles to make sure that shelves have all of the product that they are supposed to have on them and that may alert people to come restock them if they need replenishment. There are also some interesting implications of these types of stores when they become more high-tech. Our privacy potentially could be invaded and then there are also real questions about what it means for jobs because there are a lot of cashiers out there in the world and if these technologies eliminate cashiers, there are going to be a lot of people looking for work. Never underestimate the value of a professional, right? This is this is a key thing. I thought about this uh, the last time I moved as the movers came in and I'm just listening to this symphony of tape and boxes, right? It's like, wah, 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 pah, da, 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 da. and they just run it through the house and it's like, yo, I can move all this stuff myself. But these guys are professionals. See how much faster this got done, how much safer your stuff was when it got to the under end, other end. Never underestimate the value of a professional. I feel the same way about Uber and taxis. Like, if I just need to go somewhere around town, I get an Uber. I need to go to the airport. I need a pro, right? I feel like the self-checkout line at every store is your indicator that we don't give cashiers enough credit. Other than California, cashiers were striking at a union. And I was like, cashiers got a union? That seemed to be crazy to me. You get caught in line behind these people trying to ring up their own groceries. They stink at it. Like, for whatever reason, people can barely run the damn ATM fast cash, and they've had the same pins since they were in high school, right? So you're telling me that what we're going to have is these stores where you can just ring it all up yourself on your phone. People don't know how to use these things. I'm just telling you right now, it all seems like a great idea. It really does, except it's not, right? Like, you just, everybody can just ring the stuff up themselves. Okay, let me tell you what they still going to have in that store, though, by the way, when you're ringing your stuff up by yourself. Every cashier is going to be replaced with a security guard, making sure you're not stealing. And when I say they're making sure you're not stealing, I mean they're going to make sure that I'm not stealing. You might be able to get out that bad boy with everything you ever wanted. I'm getting out that bad. Hey, 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 just curious, man. Um, How much do those grapes weigh? Huh. You sure? Let's check that one more time. 
Yeah. Oh, ho, ho. looks like you left a couple on the a couple outside the bank. No, 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 no. All this stuff because it's not like. When they get rid of these cashiers, it's not like they're going to hire other people to make the business better. Like, that's the one thing. All this automation and everything, if you could tell me that they're going to move these people out of these jobs and then we're going to turn them into something else and we're going to you know do other things with them. No, nah, man, we're just going to be working for the robots. That car is going to drive. It's, that, your self-driving car is going to drive you to the unemployment line so that a robot can hand, hand you a check. And you better hope every dime that you're entitled is on that check. You better hope. Hey, this is Bomani. You have reached the right time voicemail. Say whatever you want. Get creative with it. But this is your place to talk back to the show. So talk back. Peace. All right, Bomani. This week we put out for Why I Quit Football Stories, bringing it back from the Right Time Radio Show, one of the best segments. The first one we had was from Neil in El Paso. I quit football back in the sixth grade, Geronimo Road Elementary School in Oklahoma. When I got knocked out of bounds and my face mask got stuck underneath the chain link fence, but I think that helmet is still stuck up underneath there. I crawled out, took off my shoulder pads, and said, I am out, and have never gone back. That's pretty good. With- yeah, that one ain't bad. I mean, I'd be curious to know if, if the helmet actually still is there or if he's just saying that. Just to play up the story a little bit. Yeah, I tell you, I think the, the 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 moral of the story for him is I never thought about that helmet ever again. Maybe I took it, maybe I didn't, but I had no use for it. <laughs> Our second comes from Kevin. I was a junior in high school, had a little bit of interest from outside college program, small school, nothing big. But we was at practice one day, running back came through the whole out of defensive lineman. I grabbed. Him. I was off my feet when I grabbed him. When I grabbed him. My whole body spun around. My shin hit another dude's helmet. I looked down in my shin when all this was over, and there was at least a half-inch dent in my shin bone. Bruh, the pain was so intense, I threw up right there on the spot. All college offers were canceled. I ended up getting an academic scholarship to Prairie View. I finished the season, but that's what it was. I knew right then football was done for me right now. Woo, boy, shout out to Prairie View A&M University, by the way. And judging from the tone of his voice, the, the worst idea he could have ever had at that point was to actually go play football at Prairie View because that's where they was losing all the games. <laughs> Part of it for me was him puking. Yes. Right? Uh, just going through it and, and trying to visualize the situation and having him just look at his leg and just puke. Yeah, just yeah. Just did it for me. Yeah, I'm not coming back. Like, I don't, and cats come back all the time after that. Like, you just gotta tough it out. No, you don't. <laughs> Where does it say you gotta do that? Yeah, that's it for me, fam. Yeah. Alright, our last, the guy didn't leave his name and where he was from, so please do that so we can actually give you a little pub on the podcast. Went out for my first day of practice as a freshman in high school. They asked me what position I was going out for. I said running back. And in my mind, I pictured Barry Sanders-ish. Bo Jackson-ish, thought I was pretty nimble and thought I had some breakaway speed. Now, I was probably five foot six, maybe 250-ish. I learned quickly that running back was not going to be the position for me because there's way too much running. Not a fan of running. I was a fan of touchdowns and celebrations and people being happy that I scored touchdowns for them. They wanted me to play nose guard, wasn't a huge fan of tackling, wasn't really even a huge fan of practicing for that matter. So... That's why I quit football. Ah, that interesting thought process that you had. All things, by the way, I feel like you could have figured out before you got to practice. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, if you're not a fan of practicing, maybe you're not also a fan of studying either. So then maybe it's just time to quit school too, right? Who wants to be a running back that's not a fan of running? It's in the day. That's like, yo, we could go to the Waffle House, except I ain't really about waffles. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean it didn't come to him first when he was comparing himself to Bo Jackson and (laughs) and Barry Sanders. You know, those guys do a lot of running, right? I would also like to know if you think you got some Bo Jackson and some Barry Sanders. That's an interesting uh, combination of things to put together, number one. And number two, I feel like if you actually had those things, somebody would have told you by now. Yeah, I mean, he would become the Madden-generated, like, perfect running back, yes. right? If you got a little bit of power and you got a little bit of shimmy, <laughs> yes. then you got everything. You're like a 235-pound ballerina. All right, that'll do it for uh the listener-generated questions for the week. 
we'll put out a question at the end of every week. And uh, you can leave us a voicemail at 860-516-4119. All right. That is my man, Gabe Basse, producing the podcast. Thanks so much for joining us here on The Right Time. Thank you to Jack Stewart at Wire. Check out his story on the autopilot your cars from Tesla. Thank you to Israel Daramola, staff writer at Spin.com. Check out his story about the RZA trying to buy back his album. Thank you to Nick Winfield at the New York Times, who co-authored the story on Amazon Automating the Stores. First time we rolled this out remember you can subscribe anywhere fine podcasts are available we would like it if you would subscribe at the espn app we will be doing this a couple times a week while we get started we'll see how it goes and i sincerely thank everybody who has come to rejoin us after the three months that we have been off we are going to try to figure out the best way that we're going to do this but we will be here and shout out to my man shannon penn thank you guys and we'll talk to you again later this week Thanks for checking out The Right Time with Bomani Jones Podcast. You can listen or subscribe on the ESPN app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. The Right Time with Bomani Jones.